Good evening, everybody. Just want to welcome you. Each week we do a town hall, and this week we're doing something a little different and special to give some of the voices in our school a chance to speak and provide some inspiring words for us in a time when we need it. Thank you for coming this evening. We look forward to the night. We are fortunate enough to have a group of speakers, a combination of students and staff members um, who are going to speak um, and try to put some words to some of the feelings and, and beliefs of our school community. So without further ado, we can start with the speakers. Invitation to Brave Space by Mickey Scape Jones. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We, we exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to amplify voices that fight to be heard. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This, this space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be. But it will be our brave space together. And we will work on it side by side. Okay. As we start this gathering, it is important that we honor the martyrs and victims we acknowledge this evening. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Sean Reed, Tony McGay, and Nina Pop. These are a few of the names we honor, while countless others have not been glorified from a hashtag. Now, we will have a moment of silence. Hello, and my name is Stephanie, and I'm a junior. I'm here today to open the spirit read with an excerpt from a poem I wrote entitled Unapologetically Beautiful Black and Brave. They try to silence our voices and drown out our cries, only we get louder and louder as time goes by. We will remain unapologetically beautiful black and brave. Black love and pride remains unscathed, belief in my people, the unapologetically beautiful black and brave. The purpose of this town hall spirit read is to uplift and honor the memories of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless other African-American lives who have been lost to police brutality and the racism that runs rampant in this country. Countless lives have been lost to a system that has failed us time and time again, and now is the time to speak out against the injustice more than ever. I see this spirit we read as a way to make our voices louder and louder as time goes by. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. The worst thing you can say or do now is nothing. Attend Zoom calls about the injustice in our society, donate, sign petitions to change policies in this country, attend protests, speak out on social media, educate yourself, do whatever you can in this fight for equal, actual equality that has been missing in this country for over 401 years. On behalf of the administration and the equity team, I would like to thank you all, whether you are here as a brave speaker or here as a supporter. Thank you for showing up and speaking out. Now I'll pass the mic to our next spirit reader and we'll continue on from there. 
We hope you listen with an intent to learn. Every hashtag pounded too loud. Every journalist talked too much. They shut us up and kept us from remembering that if they fixed the street, children wouldn't have rocks to throw in the first place. By Afia Irvin. We should not be held back from pursuing our full talents, from contributing what we could contribute to a society because we could fit into a certain mold, because we belong to a group that historically has been the object of discrimination. Just as buildings in California have a greater need to be earthquake proofed, places where there is greater racial polarization in voting have a greater need for prophylactic measures to prevent purposeful race discrimination. RBG. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Wettstein. I teach music at Mills and I'm going to be reading a poem called A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. And I'll pass the mic to the next panelist. Uh, I wrote a poem called I Can't Breathe. Said the black man who was suffocated by the sharp knees of a white police officer, his face scratched by the cement of the road, the nose bleed of the innocent man that wouldn't do any harm to the police. I Can't Breathe is the voice of many blacks who say to you, you hold me under my will, under the stereotypes, under my breath. Breathing is a part of life, but unfortunately, the, the, his God-given breath was taken away in a matter of minutes. I Can't Breathe, or Trayvon Martin innocently murdered because of his color walking through an uncertain neighborhood. The color of cold lives murdered because of the way God had made them. Color of how COVID, age 19, swept through the neighborhood of Blacks and silenced them with death as the death angel passed back in the day. I can't breathe. My sizzling skin to the bleach. I cry for my people. I can't breathe, my Black and brown people say as they protest. I can't breathe, nose bleeding, head aching, my soul from my body leaving to the heavens. Okay, I wrote a few words. <laughs> Overlooked as a shortened portion of history is the African American experience. I say experience because racism gets, doesn't sit too well with some people. From the first revolt on plantations to the streets in every inner city of this region, a revolution has been commissioned simply because freedom hasn't ringed. Mm -hmm. Nat Turner, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr. Agree, we can't kill an idea by any means necessary. That stretched from the meaning of its creed. Freddie Gray and Huey P. Newton continued to never kill a revolution. Don't let me die. Kamani Gray age 16, March 9, 2013. What are you following me? Trayvon Martin, age 17, February 26, 2012. I don't have a gun, stop shooting. Michael Brown, age 18, August 9th, 2014. Why did you shoot me? Kendrick McDade, 19, 
March 12th, March 24th, Mom, I'm going to college. I'm going to the Daily L, age 23, February 4, 1999. George Floyd, age 46. May 25th, 2020. I can't breathe. 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 What if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awakening us from our ignorant slumber. Here we finally accept the need for change. Declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather the most important year of them all. Hi, um, my name is Nicole, and this is the poem I wrote. It's called A Letter to the Black Community. My name is Nicole Hanau. I'm 14 years old, I was born in New York, and I like writing poetry. Oh yeah, and I'm white. I start my day by waking up. I wash my face and take a look in the mirror. At my complexion, at my cream-like skin that was dunked in privilege before I was even born. My reassurance that I could walk down the street in a hoodie at night and know that I won't be troubled by the men in blue. My privilege is armor that allows me to look a cop in the face and speak without fear that I will die. And so I will do just that. When our country turns a blind eye for those who have been murdered ruthlessly, I will fight with you, stand by you, mourn with you until justice is served on a gold platter. My privilege blesses me another day to keep fighting and thank Dios para todo. I hear you. And although I will never understand your pain, I will rise with you till the muscles in my throat drop that 244 year weight and use what this messed up society has gifted me, a perfect untainted box with a pearly ribbon called fair skin, and I will use it for good. I will use it so I don't have to make a poem like this ever again. So I don't have to wake up and see a new name trending as a hashtag. For our angels who have left us, so those same angels could look down on us and see victory. My name is Nicole Hanau. I'm 14 years old. I was born in New York. I like writing poetry. And yes, I am white for a purpose. Yep, and that was my poem. And I will pass it to the next panelist. Americans believe in the reality of race as a defined, indubitable feature of the natural world. Racism, the need to ascribe bone deep features to people and then humiliate, reduce, and destroy them, inevitably follows from this inalterable condition. In this way, racism is rendered as the innocent daughter of mother nature, and one is left to deplore the middle passage or the trail of tears, the way one deplores an earthquake, a tornado, or any other phenomenon that can be cast as beyond the handiwork of men. But race, is the child of racism, not the father. I'm protesting this place. And no, I'm not asking for money. I'm asking for change. I'm going to protest this piece, no, this place, with this piece or this piece. The problem is that white people see racism as conscious hate, when racism is bigger than that. 
Racism is a complex set of social and political levers and pulleys set up generations ago to continue working on behalf of whites at other people's expense, whether whites know it, like it, or not. Racism is an insidious cultural disease. It is so insidious that it doesn't care if you are a white person who likes black people, it's still gonna find a way to infect how you deal with people who don't look like you. Yes, racism looks like hate, but hate is just one manifestation. Privilege is another, access is another, ignorance is another, apathy is another, and so on. So while I agree with people who say that no one is born racist, it remains a powerful system that we're immediately born into. It's like being born into air. You take it in as soon as you breathe. It's not a cold that you can get over. There is no anti-racist certification class. It's a set of socioeconomic traps and cultural values that are fired up every time we interact with the world. It is a thing that you have to keep scooping out of the boat of your life to keep from drowning in it. I know it's hard work, but it's the price you pay for owning everything. A passage by Scott Woods. Good evening. Today I'll be reading an excerpt from Reggie Jackson's When the Skin You're In is the Weapon They Fear. How can you live comfortably in a world that sees your skin as a weapon? You approach the world around you differently. You either code switch or you do as I chose. I decided to stop expending energy to make white people not see me as dangerous. I realized that I had little to no control over their unconscious biases about me. I never felt a need to code switch, however, when talking to white people. Some black people feel the need to enunciate their words in a different way to show that they are intelligent. They will not say words like ain't or y'all around white people because they have been taught that is not proper English. The last thing black people want to be accused of is not being articulate. Thank you. Oh, this poem reminds me of why we can't be silent today. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This excerpt is from the book, When They Call You a Terrorist, uh, a Black Lives Matter memoir. And the author is describing a police raid in her house. On this particular raid, there are only a few cops at my place. Nothing like what we would experience in the second raid. I'm not so afraid as I am angry. Later, when I hear others dismissing our voices, our protest for equity by saying, all lives matter or blue lives matter. I will wonder how many white Americans are dragged out of their beds in the middle of the night because they might fit a vague description offered up by God knows who. How many skinny, short, blonde men were rounded up after Dylan Roof massacred people in prayer? How many brown haired white men were snatched out of bed when Bundy was killing women for sport? How many gawky white teens were stopped and frisked after Columbine or any of the mass shootings that have occurred in this nation, the immeasurably wide margin of them by young white men? What the hell is going on, I demand. Ma'am, one of them begins, it's been robberies in the area and he fits the description. I don't wait for them to finish their, their story of trouble in the neighborhood. What are you talking about? This is my husband. He lives here, I say, trying to put forward a calm I do not feel. The police back down and by now members of the community awakened by the commotion have come to stand with us. Mark Anthony's cuffs are finally removed, but the police do not leave my house for another two hours, taking down all kinds of information about him, running his license, hoping to find any reason to take him away. This man they yanked out of his own bed in the middle of the night in the house where he lives in a community where he is loved.
Before you start to judge me, step into my shoes and walk the life I'm living. And if you get as far as I am, just maybe you will see how strong I really am. When we look at names like Sandra Bland or Eric Garner or Freddie Gray, we understand that what we want is a nation where a young black man or woman can walk down the street not worrying about being falsely arrested or beaten or killed. Bernie Sanders. A reading I found, he called out for his mom, who died two years ago on the same the same day, R.I.P. Handcuffed, face down, face down, knees on his neck. They did nothing. He called the officer, sir. They did nothing. He begged for his life. He begged for water. He begged for mercy. They did nothing. His nose bled. His body trembled. He lost control of his bladder. They did nothing. He, he cried out, I can't breathe. They did nothing. Twelve more times, I can't breathe. 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 They did nothing. One last time, he gasped. I can't breathe. They did nothing. He lost consciousness. They did nothing. If I heard the man that they check his pulse, they did nothing. Off-duty medical personnel began to stop. They did nothing. Despite Deprived of oxygen, his organs screamed, screaming. His brain frantic, they did nothing. He watched, they watched George Floyd die, his life fading, a slow death. They did nothing. A lynching on the ground, they did nothing. For eight agonizing minutes, four, offer, four officers watched. He cried out for his mom, a grown man crying out for, for the woman who gave him life as he feared joining her in death. And still, they did nothing. A black man, a gentle giant, murdered because he was black. And still, they've done nothing. The officers should have been arrested. And still, they've done nothing. Don't be too heartless to type, rest in peace, rest in peace. May justice be served. Black is human too. No human being is more human than another human. I'll be reading a rework section of my piece for speech and debate. This consists of two poems that are woven together and the poems are titled, Not an Elegy from Mike Brown by Dennis Smith and Rakia Boyd by Portia Olaiwola. Poof, how magic missing must I become? How tight does my noose have to ring? How long does my body need to deteriorate before anyone can smell it rot? I guess no one hears the howling of black girl ghosts in the nighttime. We stay unheard, blotted out, buried, dead. Think, once a white girl was kidnapped and that's the Trojan War. Later, up the block, Troy got shot and that was Tuesday. Are we not worthy of a city of ash? Of 1,000 ships launched because we are missed? Always, something deserves to be burned. It's never the right thing nowadays. Black girls receive tombstones too soon and never any flowers to dress the grave. I demand a war to bring the dead boy back no matter what his name is this time. I at least demand a song. 200 black girls go missing in Nigeria and America puts out a hashtag instead of a search party. No one ever causes a riot. There ain't no boycott, nothing. Down the street, a man did a hate speech to a black butch woman and someone gave it a 10. Someone said it was freedom, I guess. Queer black women ain't black enough. I guess 
The movement ain't meant to be a crossroad. I guess we are here for play, for make-believe. Pretend? If a black boy gets shot by the cops, isn't that a tragedy? Ain't it the blues? Isn't it a misfortune if a black girl gets killed by police and the killer goes free? Does anyone notice? Do you still call it a lynching? Is her rally just a rehearsal? Ain't that why no one ever shows up? I'm sick of writing this poem, but bring the boy, his new name, his same old body, ordinary, black, dead thing. Bring him and we will mourn until we forget what we are mourning. And isn't that what being black is about? Not the joy of it, but the feeling you get when you are looking at your child, turn your head and then poof. No more child. That feeling, that's black. Thank you. And again, we'd just like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. The loss of far too many black lives to list has left our nation anguished and outraged. While now is a time for collective reflection, it's also a time for resolve. We offer some resources to learn what you can do to create a more just and equitable world. Don't let the momentum stop here. Thank you.